All right, so welcome to Squash Alchemy's uh, interview session. Um, today we've got Cameron Pilly. So just a little intro on Cameron. Cameron is from Yamba, uh, Australia, and currently resides in Greenwich, uh, America. Um, you, from 2001 to 2005, you moved to Brisbane to attend the Australian Institute of Sport, where you trained under uh, Jeff Hunt and Rodney Martin. Um, you turned pro in 2011. Your highest world ranking was number, uh, sorry, you turned pro in 2001. Yeah, I was about to say that, yeah. <laughs> Your highest world ranking was number 11. Um, no. You're three times gold medalist, two times bronze medalist winning winner. So in 2010, you uh, won a gold medal in the mixed doubles and a bronze medal in the men's doubles. Uh, 2014, you got a gold medal in the men's doubles and a bronze medal in the mixed and 2018, a gold medal in the mixed doubles. So that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Reached, uh, you recorded the fastest hitting squash ball at 281 kilometers, is that right? Yeah, it's about that, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, you're now a coach uh, working in uh, New York, uh, a husband and a uh, husband to Lena, who's former number 18 uh, squash player and uh, dad to two children yeah that's that's it yeah <laughs> so welcome Cameron. <laughs> welcome to the uh interview um thanks for joining me today i guess the interview is just all about offering some knowledge and wisdom to um juniors coming through um so yeah just helping them out as much as we can um yeah i guess we can kick it off a little bit how did you start squash and yeah like what age were you and why squash yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Lise. Um, yeah, I sort of, <clears throat> my parents played all the time. So they, they'd take me down to the squash club, you know, when I was a baby. So I was always around the squash club. So I reckon I was, my, I mean, my first tournament was when I was six. So like I've, I've probably been playing since I was five, I guess, four. Um, just, yeah, just always around the squash club when I was really young. Um, been playing tournaments ever since I was six, so I reckon there wasn't there wasn't like one time I decided I sort of wanted to go pro um, from an early age. It was more I always wanted to be a a pro sportsman at, at the time. Like I didn't really care what sport it was. I just wanted to be a pro athlete. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I sort of did a lot of sports growing up, and it was but then it was mainly squash, cricket, and golf. That was sort of my main three up until I was probably 16 mm -hmm. something like that um and yeah I guess I guess I had a lot of re decent results as a squash squash player like junior so um I sort of eventually just chose squash um and that was the path I took yeah so 2001 when you moved to Brisbane how old were you there and did you get a full scholarship straight away how was the process of that yeah so Basically, in 2000, we had our, um, you know, we had three big tournaments, a junior selection series for the Australian junior team. And that was a big goal for me. So um, I performed really well in that. Um, and I think based off my results in that, they, like, literally two weeks later, they offered me a full scholarship in the Australian Institute of Sport um, for, the, for the, like, next year, like, literally three months later. Yeah. Um, off, yeah, maybe four or five months later uh, after those tournaments. So I turned 18 at the end of October and I moved up to Brisbane in the in January. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was I was a fresh faced, green, naive 18 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously when you move to Brisbane, you're full, you know, I mean, I went to the AS as well. So you straight into two sessions a day. Before that, how much were you training and was it a huge adjustment to take over the workload that they put you under? It, it was, I mean, it was a shock to the system um, to get introduced to, you know, full-time professional training by Roddy Martin and Jeff Hunt, as, as you know. Mm. Um, so it was, you know, I, I thought I was training hard when I was like 17. Uh, clearly I wasn't. But um, it was, I reckon I was training, some days I would train twice a day. Um, if not, it was always once a day. Mm -hmm. um, 
and obviously with school, so I'd, I'd usually get up at uh, 6 a.m. And, and do my hill sprints. Um, Yamba's got some pretty good hills. So there's one infamous hill um, up Coldstream Street that yeah, basically yeah. went from my house straight up the top of the hill to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a pretty lethal hill to do some hill sprints. So I did a lot of hill sprints um, and squash in the afternoons after, uh-huh. after school. Um, but yeah, once, once I moved to Brisbane, when I turned 18, it was, you know, training twice a day, twice a day, five or six days a week. Yeah. Um, with, with one and a half days off, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was definitely a shock to the system and it, it didn't take me a lot of adjustment because I loved it. Like, mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to be a pro squash player and here I was like, you know, my job was just training for squash. So, I, you know, I, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, good. So when you say you're doing hill sprints, like what age was that? And was that driven by yourself or would your dad sort of say, come on, get your shoes on, you've got to go out and train? Um, it was, it came from me because uh, I, I sometimes I was good as a junior up until sort of under 13s, like 11s and 13s, I was really good. Then, you know, a lot of guys sort of had big growth spurts and sort of matured and I was a fairly late maturer. So then like, I, I didn't really get good again until I was under 19s where I had a bit of a growth spurt myself and, and actually put some, put some good training together. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. D- dad, dad was always there just purely whatever, whatever I wanted to do, whatever training I wanted to do, if I, if I had to go somewhere to train or he'd, he'd be there like rain, hail or shine. So, you know, I remember maybe when I was younger, like maybe 15 ish, um, 6am, it could be like, you know, raining pretty hard. Um, you know, he, he'd go with me, he'd stand up the top of the hill and basically time my hill sprints, um, which, which looking back was really cool at the time. Sometimes I get pretty annoyed with him, but, um, it, it was pretty cool to have that. And yeah, like mum and dad, just huge supporters of, you know, whatever I wanted to do. Yeah, awesome. It's good to have um, parents that support support you so well. Yeah. Definitely. Like, I couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. So obviously, okay, so you moved to Brisbane, turned pro 2001. Um, did you travel? So turning into pro, going into your pro career, did you do a lot of travelling in the first year and how did the process, you know, leading to you know, getting into pro tournaments? Yeah, like... <clears throat> So I joined, joined PSA, well, I played my first PSA tournament in, in the April of 2001. So I got, you know, three or four months of training under my belt um, before I played my first tournament. And I basically travelled just Australia and New Zealand for, for my first two years. Mm-hmm. So I think at the end of my second year as a pro, um, I went to Europe and played the Dutch Open and the World Championships in Antwerp in Belgium. Um, but for, yeah, for, for the majority of my first two years, I just travelled Australia, New Zealand, playing local tournaments, playing basically playing any tournament I could get into, just to just to get that experience and play different people and basically learn how to travel and manage yourself and and play and try and try and come out, you know, in the green if possible. But, um, yeah, some big, big learning curves in those first two years. Yeah. And was that travelling on your own or did you have someone else that you were travelling with? My first few, actually, in Australia and a few of the New Zealand ones, I was quite lucky. So um, sometimes Jeff Jeff or Rod would, would be with us. There'd be a group of us um, and they would travel with us to a lot of the tournaments. Uh, not all of them, but if it was in an okay sort of distance, we'd, we'd have our coach there. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, yeah, basically, I, I'd say from 18 months onwards, then I started really traveling out by myself, like doing a three tournament trip to Perth, Kalgoorlie, Meriden out there, um, doing a New Zealand tour by myself, playing three tournaments over there. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes with uh, Matt Sanders, um, who was also my age or is my age and was also in the institute at the same time um but yeah then then kind of after that two-year period a lot of it was just sort of traveling by myself yeah and did you find i mean were you 
comfortable doing things on your own? Was that an adjustment? Did you find it very lonely or how'd you go with that? Um, I actually loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, like it was like, I love having the, having the company when you travel is obviously good, but yeah, cause it was so new and so fresh and, you know, I was so excited that I actually, I actually really liked just traveling, like traveling by myself and sorting out, you know, my accommodation and, um, going to tournaments. And as you know, you sort of meet, meet people at tournaments and other, you know, other players that you get along well with. Mm-hmm. So you sort of, um, I guess sort of, you, you meet traveling buddies anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after those first two years, a few, a few of the guys my age sort of stopped. So then there was, there was only me. And then it was like guys sort of four or five years older, like Ricketts, Boswell and that. So mm-hmm. it was sort of, in my generation, I was sort of the only one kicking on, so I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's who I learned pretty quickly. <laughs> Definitely, I mean, some some shocking errors <laughs> back in the yeah. day, but yeah. um, like you know, it makes for, makes for a good experience and makes for stories to be told at a later date. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, um, when did you move to Europe, and when was the decision to be based there? And what was? Why did you make that decision? Was it more just to play tournaments, or was it a financial decision? Um, it was. So I would say, once I was around sort of twenty, twenty two, twenty three years old. Um, I was doing fairly big stints over in England in um, in Caversham in Reading, where Aussies have a huge history of being based there. So I went there because Boswell, Ricketts, Dan Jensen, those guys, um, they were sort of still based there on and off. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do some stints there and see if I like it. And, you know, I loved it. I mean, at the time, I wasn't a huge fan of England itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but just being around those those types of people that, you know, trained so professionally and, you know, carried themselves so well. You know, I just, I was only there for squash. I wasn't there to see the country. So I was so into my squash that it didn't really matter that it was England. Um, So that was like two and a half years in England. And then I basically wanted to change. I sort of, um, Boswell, Ricketts and Jensen all sort of left within 12 months. So then it was just me um, and my coach, Mike Johnson at the time. So I was in need of a bit of a change um, and my brother Morgan wanted to come over to Europe to pursue his, his cycling. So we sort of had a bit of a chat and I'm good mates with LJ Anjima, um, the Dutch guy. So sort of spoke to LJ. I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm thinking about like, you know, getting out of England, like, you know, and LJ's like, Oh yeah, come over to Holland. It's like, they're all right. <laughs> so, so, I'd actually never stepped foot in the Hague um, be, ever, and I sort of was like, "Oh, right, well, yeah, I'll just come and live in the Hague and train with you." <laughs> so, so I said to Morgan, like, you know, if you want to come over to to Holland, like, we we could set up in the Hague and we can live together. I'll do my squash, you do your cycling, um, and it took him about five seconds to say yes. <laughs> so we we sort of we moved in together. Me and, me and my brother in 2008. Um, and that was the start of a, an eight-year stint in Holland for me. Wow. It's pretty cool to um, actually have your brother to live, to live with. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. Like, you know, we pushed each other. We, we get along so well and we can push each other. Um, even though we do different sports, we still push each, push each other physically mm-hmm. really well. Like, you know, I'll get back from training and he'll be still, still out on the bike and I you know, he comes back and we talk about his training ride and that, that sort of motiv- motivates me to train harder. And, you know, he might see me at a tournament do well and that motivates him. So it was, it was a really, really cool sort of period of um, my career. Yeah, sure. Um, do, for juniors coming through now and wanting to turn pro, is Europe still the place to base themselves or um, in your opinion, has it changed? Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many options now. Um, I, I would say, if I, if I had to choose a place, I'd probably choose Europe. Um, I think it's good to get a huge, a huge amount of base training and um, experience playing Australia, New Zealand, because it's local. It's a lot cheaper. Um, you know, you can sort of travel to and from home, I guess, or wherever you're based. 
but I think Europe has so many options. Um, like tournament wise, financially, you can play a lot more tournaments, not necessarily just PSA, but you can play just local events that have decent money. Um, you know, a lot of juniors and yourself obviously know about leagues. So you can play for a lot of different teams in different countries where they'll, you know, I was based in Holland and, you know, I might've played seven or eight different leagues. So I'd travel to Germany or Denmark, England, Sweden, like, and, and you get paid that way as well. So there's a lot of different, different ways you can sort of make an income as well. So financially for sure. And just, you're sort of more amongst it, I guess. It's easier to travel to, um, I guess, bigger events as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so, had a pretty long career. Did you have any injuries at all? I know you had your ankle. Yeah. Long. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I was so lucky throughout my career. I, I didn't have any major injuries um, until... Um, I had ankle surgery, what was it, like just a couple of months after um, Commonwealth Games mm -hmm. um, in 2018, June, June 2018. Yep. Um, I had about seven or eight bone spurs in my left ankle. Wow. So, um, yeah, I didn't realise it was that bad. I thought, you know, I thought, I, you know, I got a, got a couple of MRIs during the Commonwealth Games. And I was like, geez, this is actually pretty bad. You need surgery. So I was like, oh, that's, that's not great. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, it was, I could get through matches fine. But, um, yeah, quite often I might just have to get on some painkillers just to get through it. Yeah. But, yeah, like, in, in general, I was really lucky. Um, mm -hmm. so, some players are lucky. Some players get injuries all the time. Like, yeah, but... A, that ankle surgery was my, my major one. Yeah, right. And do you put that down just to luck or the way you maintained your body and the training you did or? Um, possibly a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like early, early days, early institute days, I, you know, I did a lot of um, track work, a lot of court sprints, a lot of impact heavy training, which, um, I mean, yeah, I didn't know any better. Um, and obviously sports science has come a long way since and it, you know, it's always evolving. So, you know, more once I sort of moved away and um, especially once I started basing myself in Europe and doing my own research and talking to other pro players about what they, they sort of do. And um, also just experimenting and finding what training really sort of suited my body as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm sort of long and skinny um, where I found a lot of non-impact stuff was the best, like hill sprints, stair sprints, um, different types of jumps, upstairs, um, plyometric type stuff where there's... Um, I found all that really good for me. Yeah, okay. I guess, um, I mean, you know, doing all of those hard running and hill sprints at the start... Um, I know it's not great as you get older, but I mean, it would have helped you to build a pretty good base, fitness base, uh, from, you know, the get go. Oh, massively, massively. Like it was, I mean, I needed to do it. It was, it was something that I was, you know, I think it's something that all, all juniors need to do at some stage. Um, and I think it gave me, it was basically two years of court sprints and track work, like 400s, 300s. And it just gives you, gives you such a strong base fitness, but, but then also mentally like knowing, knowing that you can get through some of those sessions, even though you might be halfway through a session or even you wake up in the morning and you're like, how am I going to get through 16, 400s here? Like, I feel like, you know, I feel terrible. Um, you know, once you get through it, like, you know, an hour later, you know, you feel great and you, you kind of feel proud of what you've just done. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a must, it's a must for all juniors to get a huge base, base fitness early on. Yeah, it's good advice. So you say two years, cause I know a lot of juniors and nowadays, I don't know whether it's, you know, our lifestyle now, it's self gratification, but they do it for like two months and then they go, oh, 
oh, I don't, I'm not fit yet. You know, when's this going to happen? And I try and explain to them, you know, it's going to take probably a few years to build this space fitness. And I think, oh, they get yeah. scared. I, think, I think they get scared when they hear that. Yeah. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, um, I mean, yeah, we, we do live in, a, in, a, in an age of like instant gratification. Like everything's just like, you know, I want it now, now, now. Um, but I mean, a two, two months is like, you know, that's, that's a training block leading up to a tournament. Like that's, 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 that's not setting your base fitness for you, for the rest of your career. Um, like we, we would, you know, I remember we would do it for say two months in the lead up to a tournament. Um, you know, we might taper off for a little bit and play the tournament. If we have a tournament a week later, obviously we train early in that week, but then we get ready for the tournament. But then the tournament's finished a couple of days later. Like we're, we're back into the, you know, that stuff that we were doing over and over again. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think that definitely helped set my body up for, for a long career because um, I know some guys on tour who are quite injury prone and they never, they never actually put that huge base fitness together early on in their career. Yeah. Um, they kind of did what you said, just they might put a month or two together and play a tournament or then get injured and then they don't do it for six months and then they do something else because that didn't work. But, I mean, you just you, you got to stick to it. And I know a few pros that I think have maybe given up on um, some of their goals or, yeah, I guess goals in squash a little bit early where, you know, sometimes I think if they just put, put another 12 months together, it might have actually clicked. Um, but, yeah, I, I, just, I just sort of stuck with it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't jump up the ranks quick. It was just a gradual mm-hmm. improvement. Yeah, yeah, cool. It's good. It's so such good advice because, like I said, you see so many juniors just give up, you know, too early. And so, mm. yeah, sticking at it <laughs> pays yeah, off. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah. So, through your career, what was the main main highlight through your pro career? Oh, good question. Um, probably, probably a few, a few, a few of my highlights that I'm quite proud of would be. Um, I guess, well, go, attending, yeah, making the Commonwealth Games. Um, obviously, winning gold medals at those events are the highlights, but being, being in the Commonwealth Games camp in the Athletes' Village, you know, as you know, it's like, it's so special. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so Commonwealth Games, definite top three, top two. Um, playing for Australia in the World Team Championships where... You know, you're sort of playing for your teammates and you're playing for all your... Basically, you're playing for every squash player in Australia. Like, you know, people, people follow, your, follow your sort of results and what you're, what you're doing. So it, I guess it's added pressure, but if you don't look at it as pressure, it's not, but it's almost like an added responsibility. Um, so World Team Championships um, and probably on a personal level, probably... Um, probably making the final of the Hong Kong Open back in 2015. Um, I was unseeded and beat quite a few seeds along the way to make the final. Um, that was my first first major tournament final. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Well done for that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, was... like, the two ones that you suggested first, Com Games and Teams, it's, it's funny that, you know, we play an individual sport, but, I mean, I'm in the same boat. My, when I represented Australia, it was, for me, um, my, my best moments. And it's funny that you play an individual sport, but the highlights are actually when you're playing in a team environment. So I don't know whether that's yeah. due to um, the lack of being together or um, just the fact that you're putting an Australian shirt on. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's probably a bit of both. Um, I guess there's not too many opportunities to really represent Australia in squash. So, I, you know, I guess when you, when you get the chance to do it, you just you grab it with both hands and you, you feel so honoured. Um, when, when you play individually, you are representing Australia, but when you go to these team events, you're, you're literally putting on the Australian shirt and, and playing for the country, which yeah. I think that's pretty special. Yeah, sure is. Yeah, it's a pretty good career. And uh, so now you're coaching, is that right? 
Yeah, full-time coach now, Lise, um, over here in... Um, so the club I'm coaching at is the Apawamas Club. Um, did, did you play a tournament at the Apawamas Club years ago? Yeah, I did, yep. Yeah. Um, so coaching there, I'm the director of junior squash at the club. Um, I couldn't tell you how many juniors we've got. We've got a fair few. It's got to yeah. be... It's got to be pushing 100. Um, so, yeah, full-time coach over here now. Okay. And how the decision to become a coach, was that an easy decision or did you always know that you wanted to be a coach? Um, I always wanted to stay in squash. Um, you know, I, I, love, I love squash. So, you know, I was, I was at the end of my squash playing career and, you know, th- this opportunity came up where it was – you know, I was I was tempted to play one more year on tour, but you know, this to be honest, this this opportunity was too good to not go for. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I you know I applied for the applied for the position and you know flew over here and did some interviews and and managed to to get the job. So, um, but yeah, sorry, getting back to your question, yeah, I mean, co- coaching juniors and and getting helping them achieve their goals and whether it be you know especially in america college squash is so big and just getting into colleges so you know for a lot of them it's getting into that college that they want to get into if they can get a scholarship you know that's that's huge and um helping them improve and and reach that goal is is pretty special yeah so what's your regular day like how many kids do you coach do you do them in groups or are they schools that come through or are they all individual um, all of the above. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll do I'll do quite a bit of admin stuff um, during the day, and then you know we don't we can't start start coaching the juniors until the you know school finishes. So um, I usually will get on court around three thirty. Um, there might be a few hours of uh, individual one on ones or you know two two on a court. Um, and then usually from like uh, I would say six thirty ish through till about eight um, is basically group training. So um, three times a week we have our uh, uh, two times two or three times a week we have our elite juniors where they all come in for an hour and a half and we put put them through their paces. And on the other on the alternating nights we have the group just below them as well. So. Uh, it's it's a real mixture, and then on weekends it's a mixture of um, you know one on one sessions, maybe small groups, some adults, um, yeah, a whole a whole mixture on the weekends. Yeah, well, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um I mean it was a shock to the system because I was mm. I I didn't finish my career until you know December last or December last year, and me and the family moved over in August. So for, you know, sort of three months, I was trying to juggle playing on the tour still and traveling to tournaments and doing my training as well as uh, coaching full time, mm-hmm. uh, which, which was pretty tough. Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I know, know that. So when I was in America, I did quite a lot of coaching and trying to play at the same time, but yeah, it's just too, too it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. Like, you know, I, I could do it, but, you know, my level of play sort of dropped because you, you've you got other priorities as well. So yeah. it was tough. Yeah, cool. All right. So now also a dad. So you've got two children. Um, yeah. Yeah. How's that? And I'm sure it's a lot easier now that you're based home a bit more permanently. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've got Carla. She's like, she's two and a half. And we've got little Leo. He's five months. So, um, I mean, they, they keep me busy. That's for sure. (laughs) Um, but it's uh, like, it's, yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, not, not traveling now is good. You know, I'll be away, I'll be away from the house, you know, still a bit, but it's only to work, which is 15 minutes away. So it's not like, you know, it's not like going away for a week to a tournament. Um, but yeah, like we're pretty settled over here now, like me and Lena. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Raising, raising two kids, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, I know, right. <laughs> so I guess um, 
just a little bit of insight on, I mean, I know you're coaching in America, so I'm sure the pathways can, you know, very different to the pathway in Australia. Um, but just going from your, you know, your pathway from junior, you know, then going to the AIS and then following that, that process, in your opinion, like how different is it from your day to today for the juniors? Um, I think it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, I mean, if I just like the, the, the juniors I coach here, you know, a lot of them will get, uh, at least one private, uh, coaching session a week Mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll attend like at least three, um, group training sessions. Like say, say if you're an elite kid, he'll get one private session a week and he'll join three group training sessions with the other elite juniors. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the odd days, they might be in doing a solo or, yeah. you know, get a buddy and train with them as well. Yeah. And what age um, are they? Uh, they range between, I guess, 11 up until 17, turn, turn, turning 18. Wow. Okay. So um, they're, they're hitting about four to five days a week. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of, you know, some of the guys and girls I coach, you know, they, they're into it so much. I mean, they're, they're, they're playing five, six days a week. They're, you know, they're training, they're training hard, uh-huh. um, which, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with. They're, you know, they're really putting in the work. And, you know, if we give them a, an off-court sort of training schedule or something, like they'll, they'll do it. They'll make sure they've got time to do it. Wow. Um, so, th- so the commitment from the, from the kids, you know, is, is spot on. And, you know, if it's, if they don't want to do it, then they don't want to do it. But, you know, if they come to training that they, they, they are going to put in and, and make sure it's a hundred percent. Yeah. Right. And what's, what's their motivation? What's driving them? Is it more just the, you know, if they can get good at it for school or is it more, they want to turn pro what's, what's driving their commitment? Um, th- there's a, there's a couple of kids that want to go pro, which I'm stoked with. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them, especially the older ones, obviously they want to get into a good college. And if you're good at a sport, that's almost like a, um, you know, an extra weapon in your arsenal, I guess it's, you know, it's something could, that could add to your, your positives of getting into a, a college. Um, but they all, they all play a lot of tournaments as well. So, you know, they, they're, they're training for, for these big junior tournaments where there's like, I mean, there's, there's a couple of hundred kids, you know, a couple of hundred juniors in, in these tournaments. So um, that, that competitiveness in, in tournament players is a big motivation as well. I mean, obviously, to- you know, if juniors are playing tournaments, that, that should be a goal. Like, you know, I know I, if I went to a tournament, I didn't want to lose. Like, I'm, I'm training so hard because I, I want to go and win the tournament. Yeah. And if, if you win it, stoked. Like, how good is it? This. and if you don't win it or if you have a bad loss like that's just for me that was just such big motivation to like you know have a couple of days off and then I was just going to smash the training like straight away like I, I, I wanted to get revenge I, I wanted to go back and win the next tournament <laughs> um so like I think but I think just having small goals as well like maybe a small fitness goal or you know if there's someone in training who they can't beat or if they normally beat them they might want to try and bagel them or something like where you know that can sort of help just just sort of small daily goals as well but um yeah i found tournament tournaments were were huge motivation for me yeah cool great advice all right so last question um looking back on your career all the knowledge and experiences that you've gained um what advice would you give to a junior just wanting to pursue squash as a sport i mean not even if they want to turn pro you know they just want to their main sport to be squash what advice would you give them um, I mean, for me, I, I, I loved it. So it was, it was enjoyable and I had a passion for it. So, you know, if, if you love playing squash or, you know, if you get hooked and it's, it's your passion, like, yeah, I, I'd say just, just follow through with it. If you, if you want to have a crack at going pro, then like go for it, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, go, go see people like yourself, get, get some training from, from the ex pros that sort of have been there and done it um instead of instead of maybe trying to do it themselves and they 
they might take the long way around something where, you know, you might get some advice and learn how to do something straight away. And that can sort of, um, you know, it might be a short, a shortcut to learning something which could take you six months by yourself. Um, but I'd say, yeah, just enjoy it. And, you know, if you, if you want to have a crack, you've, you've got to put in the hard work. Like it's, um, you know, I think, you know, looking back on my career, like I loved the, the lifestyle of a squash player. Like it was, it was, it was so cool. Um, you know, tra- traveling the world, playing squash and, you get to a tournament and you sort of see your friends that you haven't seen for a while. So you're meeting up for coffees and, you know, you're exploring a new city and a new country. Um, so that, that was also, I, I wanted to stay on tour and I wanted to, I wanted to get better and better and go to sort of better places as well. So um, yeah, that, that was, that was a motivation as well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's, there's no, there's no shortcut to success like if you if you want to get better you've got to put in the hard work like that's like period well there you go juniors hear it from cameron philly himself you've got to put in the hard work (laughs) (laughs) well thanks philly thanks for um giving us your advice and all your knowledge that you've gained um i'm sure a lot of kids you know these podcasts here just help we can help one junior at a time that's awesome just giving some advice so thank you for your time Not a problem. Thanks for having me on, Lise, and and good to chat to you.